make sure that you are a long-term value investor like Warren Buffett and you're not day trading. Day trading is not investing. Day trading is a totally different game. I highly don't recommend anyone become a day trader. Um, you're just basically playing with numbers and charts, but become a value investor. Hi, I noticed that a lot of people want to become software engineers because of the high salary. However, there's a lot of software engineers that aren't really wealthy and even the ones that do have high salaries are still struggling in their lives financially. So I wanted to create this video to help people understand different ways of becoming wealthy as a software engineer. Uh, keep in mind that this video might be a little long and it might be dry. But if you like this subject, then you might also enjoy this video. And I really want you to kind of picture these two different types of engineers in your mind. The first type is the humble, nerdy, but poor Joe. Uh, he's one of those very smart kids that created their own programming language when he was in college. He teaches machine learning and artificial intelligence in the weekend. He works at an average company for an average TC. He lives a pretty normal life despite his talent and smarts and he brought a nice house in a good neighborhood. Uh, so you can think of his net worth to be somewhere around one to five million dollars by the time he turns 60. On the other hand, I want you to imagine a savvy, smart, but rich Fatima. She can't, unlike the humble, nerdy, but po poor Joe, she can't create a programming language but she can solve lead code problems with her eyes closed. She moved to Silicon Valley for more opportunities. She works at a prestigious tech company that everyone wants to join, has an abnormally high TC for her age, and she has a passive income so she can earn while she sleeps. You can think of her net worth to be somewhere around 30 to $50 million by the time she turns 60 years of age. So how did she do that? Well. She basically took three different steps to get where she is. It's not like she inherited all of this wealth. Anyone can do what she did as long as they follow these three different steps. The first one is basically to avoid debt and spend conservatively. And once you do that, you also want to earn a very high salary and earn money while you sleep. We'll talk about all of this uh, step by step. So the first step is basically to avoid debt and spend conservatively. You want to avoid bad debt as much as possible. So bad debt, debt uh, is basically something that doesn't appreciate in value. So for example, when you do a car loan or when you have credit card debt or when you finance expensive TVs, laptops or whatever, uh, you know, with a credit card or, or, or whatever um, methods you're using to accumulate debt. This is extremely bad for you because of the interest rates uh, that accumulate over time. What you want to do is avoid credit card debt. Even if you're paying it off 100% every month, uh, and even if you're paying zero interest for your credit cards. And here's why. You spend money according to your behavior and not according to your calculations. Like your mind is not um, calculating uh, every day to see how much you're spending and, and whatnot. All of your purchase decisions happen based on your behavior. Credit cards encourage more spending behavior. That's, I mean, companies will, uh, credit card companies will, will spend decades to research to, to figure out how they can get you to spend more money. And just because you think you're paying off 100% does not necessarily mean that they're not changing your spending habits and your behavior. Studies shows that you spend 30 to 60% more when using credit cards because A, you want to accumulate more points, B, you have time to pay it off, and C, it's not coming from your bank account. So obviously you're gonna end up spending way more money with credit cards than you would with cash. Let's take a, a, an example here. Uh, let's say that you, you go to a restaurant and you pay with a credit card. Let's just say that you spend $15 on a meal and you pay 25% tip, and your total payment comes out around $18.75 minus the 5% uh, cashback. So all these credit cards, they have these fancy percentages, right? 5% is a, is a pretty big number, and I'm being generous here, but even with 5%, um, let's, let's just say that in total you spend around 
um, $17.8. However, with cash, you're more likely to spend a lot less money on a meal. You're probably going to be spending $10 on that meal. And instead of generously paying 25% tip, you're probably going to be spending $15 tip. Your total payment comes out around $11, $11.5. Uh, you don't have any cash back, that's all right, but you end up spending around $11.5. 50 cents. That means that you saved around 54%. Imagine saving 54% whenever you go out to a restaurant just because you have to pay in cash. So your, your behavior, your spending behavior changes. So it's true that with credit cards, you, you might accumulate more points and you get all these cash backs and what have you. But on the other hand, these credit cards are encouraging you to spend more money. And by simply saving a few dollars here and there, you're going to be saving 54% of your spending. Another example would be a going to a gas station. Uh, suppose that you are constantly using your credit cards to pay for gas. And because it's convenient, you go to Shell and you pay around $3.70 per gallon. Uh, and you basically fill up your tank with 10 gallons. Uh, let's just use 10 for to, to make this example easier to understand. And, you get 4% cash back. So your total comes out around $35.52. Um, However, if you're spending, um, if, if you're purchasing gas with a debit card or cash, uh, you're more likely to go to a gas station that uh, is perhaps a lot cheaper, but will accept cash only. So for example, let's just say that you go to Arco and you spend $3.46. So your total comes out to be $34.60. And just by doing that, you're saving 2.66% even with the cash back that you get in your credit card. So these examples are just to demonstrate that your behavior changes according to your spend. Your, your spending habits basically change according to your behavior. When you use a credit card, your behavior changes. And that's very important to understand. Just remember always that cash only, you end up saving more and you end up basically keeping more of your wealth by using cash only uh, compared to, to credit cards, even when you accumulate all these points and you pay zero dollars in interest. Okay, so what you wanna do is make sure that you spend conservatively to save money. You wanna avoid expensive cards, you wanna avoid daily takeouts, avoid buying things that you really don't need. Uh, a, a poor engineer would, would make around $100,000 but spend $90,000 and end up saving only $10,000, whereas a rich plumber uh, will only make around $50,000, uh, but because he only spends $20,000, he ends up saving $20,000 more than this engineer. So just because you're an engineer, a software engineer making a lot of salary, uh, does not mean that or you'll end up saving more because as long as your spending habits increase with your higher salary, you're, you'll probably not be uh, saving a lot of money. So just make sure that you save a lot of money. If you don't save a lot of money, then you know it's just useless to have all these high salaries. So we talked about the first step, which was to avoid debt and spend conservatively. Now let's talk about the second step, which is to earn a high salary. Uh, there's two types of incomes. There's an active income and there's the passive income. The definition of an active income is a fixed income you earn for the services or goods that you provide. The definition of a passive income is basically income that you earn while you sleep. You can earn passive and active income at the same time, but let's talk about them individually first. Uh, you can think of an active income with a straight line with a positive slope. Your income increases or decreases based on the amount of time or effort uh, or goods that you provide. So the good news is that you're already one step forward by being an engineer, by being a software engineer. Uh, you're probably one of the highest paid profes profes professions uh, in the United States and, and maybe the rest of the world. So you don't really have to worry about making the right career move because you're already a software engineer. So you're already one step forward. But you want to make sure that you earn a very, very high salary as a software engineer. In order to do that, signaling and personal brand becomes extremely important. And this is the reason why you want to do things like going to a top university, 
you want to move to the right location, you want to join a prestigious tech company, you want to learn negotiation skills, you want to make sure to learn multiple stacks, and you want to climb up the ladder for bigger titles. So let's talk about that individually here. The first step is to go to a top university. It matters a lot. Going to a, a great university matters a lot, and that's because of signaling. You can study the same thing at another university, but Harvard is always going to be Harvard. That Stanford kid will always get more attention. He's like that tall, handsome dude with a beautiful jawline. Women will always notice him first. Uh, that doesn't mean that women will ignore your other traits. Likewise, companies will also look at your other skills, but never underestimate the power of signaling. Going to a great university is absolutely important if you want to create a strong brand for yourself. It's not just about what you learn in the university, it's also about creating a strong brand for yourself. This is unfortunately the way that uh, it works in this world. The second thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you move to the right location. As your teacher said in your high school, location, location, location. Some examples of great places to move is Silicon Valley, Seattle, Vancouver, New York, Berlin, Beijing, and Bangalore. You want to live in suburbs to save money but close enough, but to, to stay close enough to make the commute easier. Uh, so for example, you don't want to live in the heart of San Francisco because you'll just end up spending a lot of money for rent. Um, but you, you probably want to move to a place like San Jose, Milpitas area so that the rent is a lot cheaper, but the commute isn't uh, terrible. You'll have unlimited opportunities if you live in the right city. And if you're living in a city where tech boom isn't happening, consider moving out. So if you're living in, um, I don't know, Ohio or uh, Mississippi, then I highly suggest that you move out to one of these cities that are listed here. If you're living in the U.S., then uh, definitely consider moving to Silicon Valley. Uh, even though it's expensive, it's definitely worth uh, living here because when, when you move here, you'll be paying a lot more in rent, uh, but on the other hand, your opportunities will be endless. The third thing I mentioned was joining a prestigious tech company. A lot of people will put me down for saying this, but joining a prestigious tech company is, is actually very, very important. Uh, an example of a prestigious company would be like Fang, so Facebook, Apple, Netflix, uh, Google, or um, any companies from, from this list. So this is a Y Combinator page. I'm gonna include this in the, in the uh, description box, but basically uh, you wanna join a company that is very well known, it's very prestigious, and it's a high tech company. So any of these top 20 lists would be great. So Airbnb, Stripe, Cruise, Dropbox, Coinbase, Instacart, uh, you know, Machine Zone, DoorDash, blah, blah, blah. All of these companies are amazing companies that you should definitely consider joining. If the company isn't prestigious, if it's not known, then you're not really building a strong brand for yourself, uh, which means that your opportunities will become limited. Unlike top universities, getting into a prestigious company is a lot less competitive and easier to do. There's no entrance exam, there's no hard requirements. In fact, you can even apply to a large prestigious company um, without a CS degree, or even a, a degree for that matter. Whereas if you, if you want to apply to a, a top university, then you're not only competing against all these uh, very, very smart individuals, but you also have to have these minimum requirements such as SAT exams and what have you. You want to lead code your head off and you, you don't want to give up. I, I have a, a whole video of how to prepare for technical interviews uh, by using lead code, but, but it's very, very important that you're constantly lead coding, you're constantly keeping yourself up to date, uh, or you're constantly solving these algorithm challenges so that you, you don't become weaker um, so that when you do want to apply to different companies, you're always ready. Um, there's three advantages to joining a prestigious company. Uh, one of them is that they, they're perfect for your resume and personal brand like I talked about, and they open up endless opportunities. So for example, if, if you have a friend or, or if you know someone, maybe a friend's friend, that is thinking of starting a company, um, and they're thinking of recruiting engineers for their company, 
uh, maybe they're looking for a CTO or uh, VP of engineering or, or whatever, they're probably going to reach out to you if you work at one of these very prestigious large tech companies. If you, if you don't have um, a solid resume, you, you either have to work at a, a very good and a top prestigious company, or you have to have uh, a great university in your background. If you have neither of those two, then you're gonna have a very, very hard time um, getting all these lucrative opportunities. The other advantage of joining uh, these, these great tech companies is that you'll have a very, very competitive uh, offer. And finally, you'll have amazing benefits and perks. Um, one of the examples is uh, the company that I work at, they give four months of paternity leave. Four months is a lot. And I mean, I know many, many companies which are even tech companies that don't give four months of paternity leaves, right? So you want to join a, a very good tech company that gives you all of these amazing benefits. And, and you know, frankly, that's where all the big things are happening, right? You'll be years ahead of, ahead of everyone else by joining a top tech company. If you work at Google, if you work at any of these fang companies or or any of the companies that I showed you, um, or or any of these well-known big companies, then you are more likely to be years ahead in terms of technology and industry news and, and, and um, all of these other things compared to your friends or other people that uh, aren't working at these tech companies. After you uh, decide to join a prestigious company and you're, you're ready, make sure that when you get offers that uh, you negotiate for a very, very, very high salary. My rule of negotiation is a toy ship till. A toy ship till just means if the offer isn't shockingly high, it's probably too low. Always remember that, right? You you have to be shocked by the offer. It, it has to be so high that you're, sh you're, you're just shocked. If you're not shocked, then the offer is probably too low. Just keep in mind that companies are desperate for good engineers. So use that to your advantage. You want to also have competing offers so that you can maximize your leverage. Uh, to, to learn more about negotiation, uh, you should read this article. I'm going to include this in uh, the page in the description box. But it's uh, this guy named Hasib Qureshi. He talks about um, basically the rules for negotiation. It's a pretty long uh, blog post, uh, but it's, it's extremely helpful. So make sure that you learn about uh, how he did negotiation and, and different strategies to do that. Another thing you want to do is you want to learn multiple tech stacks, right? Don't be stuck in your domain. So if, if you're a backend engineer, don't just be stuck knowing backend engineer for the rest of your engineering life. Learn front end development, see how it works, uh, make some iOS apps or make some Android apps. If you're an iOS developer, learn how backend development works. You got to learn, you know, different tech stacks and uh, it's extremely easier for you to learn all of these things once you join a company uh, than it is for you to learn them sequentially while you're looking for a job. So if you're in a stage of looking for a job, I wouldn't be uh, learning multiple stacks. I would just fo focus on one stack um, and, and learn that. But if you already have a, a great job, if you're already working at a great tech company um, and, and you did all these different things to get there, then while you're at that at that great tech company, uh, I would invest a lot in um, learning different domains, learning different tech stacks. Maybe you can ask your manager to, to um, give you tasks that uh, you know have to do with other tech stacks. That, that's extremely important. And you also want to learn system design. This is also extremely important. So even if you're not applying for a back-end role, which, uh, you know, in that role, you have to learn about how to design all of these scalable systems, right? Like, let's say you're a front-end engineer. You don't necessarily have to know that. You should probably still learn that because that's uh, that's a very valuable skill to have. You want to attend meetups organized by geeks. You'll know if someone is truly a geek, uh, but you really want to attend these great meetups. But at the same time, you also want to avoid useless meetups, events, and meetings. Always be coding, A, B, C. Just remember that. Just just code as much as you can. Learn as many uh, different technical stacks as you can, and, and make sure to basically expand um, expand your your skill set. And finally, I want to talk about climbing up the ladder for bigger titles. This is also very important if you want to have a very high um, salary, uh, if you want to make a very high 
uh, active income. Remember, we're talking about active income in all of these different slides for now. Despite what people say, titles do mean a lot. Uh, titles are not meaningless. There's two different tracks that you can take to um, gain a, a higher title. One is the, the manager track and the other one is uh, the individual contributor track. It used to be the case where uh, once you have certain amount of um, IC uh, experience, then you become a manager and all of a sudden your, um, your TC just increases uh, tenfold, right? It's no longer the case. Right now, uh, there are different tracks for individual contributors and there's different tracks for managers. And this is especially true for um, Silicon Valley high tech startups, right? So you want to identify what track you want to uh, go into from early on. Um, so the manager track goes something like you become an engineer manager and then a senior engineering manager uh, and then maybe the director of engineering and the vice president of uh, the, the VP of engineering and then uh, or a CTO of a company. So this, these are uh, different tracks that you can take. Um, individual contributor track will look something like, you know, you're in level one, level two, level three, level four. Uh, and you go all the way until you become a, a tech leader or whatnot. Um, every, every company has different um, tracks that you can take. Make sure that when you join that tech company that you identify the track that you're interested in pursuing and you make sure that uh, you talk to your manager and see what uh, levels are possible so that you make sure that you, you're moving up the ladder. Okay, so you know you, you did all of these different things. You have a very high salary. You have a very high uh, active income, but make sure, like I said, to save, 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 and save. You don't want to be that engineer that earns, that has a, a five hundred thousand dollars salary, but only has saved twenty or fifty thousand dollars. That's that's very sad. And unfortunately, a lot of people fall into this trap of spending a lot of money using credit cards, thinking that, oh, I'm gonna just pay off all my debt, I'm just gonna pay off um, all my credit card bills so that I have zero, I have to pay zero dollars in interest, uh, but then they just end up spending a lot of money, right? The third step of becoming a rich software engineer is, uh, this is very important, that is to earn money while you sleep. You want to, uh, and this is called passive income, right? Passive income is basically you own a part of something where the value of that thing grows exponentially over time, even when you're not working. And that's very, very important to, to have. Think of passive income as this uh, exponential line, or exponential curve, um, and the active income to be this uh, straight line with this positive slope, right? Initially, with active income, you might be making more money, but over time, when you start uh, earning your earning an exponential passive income then that will uh, by far by far uh, outweigh the uh, active in income that you have right now the best way to earn passive income is to have long-term ownership of a machine that generates wealth a business is a machine that is supposed to create wealth but not all businesses create wealth Great businesses create a lot of wealth. So, to earn passive income that grows exponentially, one must own a piece of a great business, equity, in exchange for risk. Okay? So, you basically want to, in order to, to have uh, an exponential passive income, you have to own equity. You have to own a piece of uh, a business that is growing rapidly. There's three ways of owning equity. One is uh, to join a business that issues equity. The second way of doing that would be to pay a business in exchange for equity. Uh, the third option is to start a business and own equity. Just remember that higher equity typically means higher risk, which translates to higher reward if the business becomes successful. So let's talk about joining a business that issues equity. This is the easiest way to own equity. It's like hitting two birds with one stone, right? Uh, you earn passive and active income at the same time by joining uh, a company that issues equity, right? So if you if you join a company like Airbnb or if you join a company like Facebook, these companies um, will issue uh, 
competitive uh, equity package, right? So that your total compensation will, your, your total comp will consist of not only the base salary, uh, but also uh, a piece of business that you get to own simply by joining the company and by working there. The smaller the business, the more equity you'll earn. That's generally riskier, right? Only join a small startup after doing a lot of research about the company, founding team, and investors. Uh, but by, by by joining a small startup, the upside is, is a lot. Um, if the startup becomes a unicorn startup, if it becomes a billion dollar company, then your chances of becoming a millionaire is, is significantly higher as opposed to joining a well-established uh, company that uh, has basically not necessarily reached its peak, but it'll take a long time for it to uh, rapidly grow. And it's definitely not gonna grow at, at the same pace as a small startup. Um, but make sure, again, that you do a, a thorough research and you understand what kind of business you're going into, what kind of company you're joining. Don't just join a company because um, some founder is offering you 5% or 10% of his company. That's very common here in Silicon Valley. They'll, they'll try to call you and, and convince you to join these small companies in, in exchange for a very high equity, but just know that there are opportunity costs. Uh, by joining a small company, you might end up um, having zero dollars worth of company or zero dollars worth of equity after a few years whereas if you had joined google or facebook uh or a different large company then your chances of uh, the equity being translated into cash is significantly higher if you want to take some risks um with modest reward i highly recommend that you join a unicorn startup that is likely to ipo in the coming years so i showed you a list of different top y combinator startups if you join any of these startups um, chances are these startups will uh, IPO very soon and you know this is a great time to join those companies because um, you know if, if the company is going to IPO in a couple of years from now but it hasn't already IPO then um, your chance the chances of your stock uh, your stocks doubling or growing a lot is a lot higher and the risks at the same time are also not that uh, not that significant one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is thinking that equity or uh, these RSUs that are issued by pre-IPO companies are like monopoly money. That is not the case. That, that That's probably the case if you join a very small company, but if you join a very large company that is doing uh, terrific as far as revenues are concerned, um, they have some very solid fundings from great venture capitalists, uh, then the money that you are issued, the equity that you're issued is, is definitely not monopoly money. A lot of these companies um, would have gone IPO uh, had it not been for regulations or had it not been for the immense amount of capital that is um, available in a venture capital world. So don't make this mistake into thinking that uh, equity that is issued to you by these pre-IPO companies is, is equivalent to getting monopoly money. That's just not true. Uh, if you want little to no risk, then join a publicly traded company like Apple. Uh, then obviously you're, uh, you can just very rapidly convert your, your stocks into cash. Um, but make sure that uh, you understand that, that the only way to earn an exponentially high um, passive income in your sleep, that you must take some kinds of, of risks. So no risks, no reward. The second way of owning a piece of business is uh, to pay a business in exchange for equity. So the most common method is to invest in stocks. Or you can invest in pre-IPO companies uh, by becoming a limited partner at a venture capital. Uh, but for most, engineer, for most engineers, it's best to just invest in stocks. Make sure that you are a long-term value investor like Warren Buffett and you're not day trading. Day trading is not investing. Day trading is a totally different game. I highly don't recommend anyone become a day trader. Um, you're just basically playing with numbers and charts, but become a value investor. If you don't know what value investing is, then go, go search it up and uh, become a value investor. But do take your time to learn about investing in stocks. Every wealthy person owns equity in great businesses. It is important that you learn how to identify those great businesses so that you can take part in, in, in the ownership. 
Um, there's this great book called One Up Wall Street by, by Peter Lynch that I highly recommend that you read. Uh, it's a great book for an average person that wants to learn how he can start investing in stocks. Uh, it's not scary. It's, it's, it's not you know, rocket science um, to be able to pick the right stocks. And this book is, is, is a wonderful book that will show you how to pick the right stocks. The third way of um, owning a piece of business is to start a business yourself. That way you can own a large chunk of that business. Um, the easiest, and that's the easiest and the, and the, and the cheapest way of um, basically owning an entire company, right? Is just to start your own company. But keep in mind that 100% equity in a $0 company will give you $0. Uh, as a software engineer, you have an amazing leverage when it comes to starting a company. Don't worry about sales and marketing. Bill Gates said that he would rather teach an engineer sales than to teach a salesman how to create a product. Um, if you want to learn how to start a startup, uh, then you can watch these videos. Again, I'll include them in the description box below. But basically, um, uh, these are uh, lecture series by Y Combinator, and they teach you how to start uh, a startup. So in summary, uh, in order to be a rich software engineer, go to a top university. Um, otherwise, uh, or in parallel, you can also join a prestigious tech company. Hustle your way up. Learn multiple tech stacks. Save money. This is very important. And earn a very high salary, i.e. active income, and own equity, passive income. And that's it. I hope that this video was beneficial. Thank you very much for listening to this video.